Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. My guest today, like lots of Americans, is very interested in genealogy, in tracing her family back as far as she can get it. Her quest is more difficult than most people because her ancestors were slaves in Livingston County and in Crittenden County here in Western Kentucky. Her name is Pam Smith. She is from Chicago and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, tracing your family tree back. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Barry. Happy to be here. Your family left in 1910, mm -hmm. which is a little bit ahead of, of the great migration of mm -hmm. African Americans out of the South into the North. Mm -hmm. You grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in, in tracing your roots back here to Western Kentucky? Well, I think it all started with uh, watching Alex Haley's Roots. Yes, I remember that well. Still considers to be the most watched television miniseries ever. I can you believe know, it. For whites it and blacks. Hennington, so. Henning, Tennessee, down in Weston, near Memphis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that got me curious about, well, where did my family come from? You know, so I talked to my grandmother. My mother's not so into all this family history stuff. I think a lot of my genealogy friends can relate to that. You know, everybody's not right. always interested. Right, exactly. Um, but my grandmother um, gave me some information. Um, that was on my mother's side. My father's side, um, I knew that there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, mixed race going on on that side of my family. And it took me a long time to really want to look at that, you know, and to deal with that. So um, it was really after doing, I did a couple of DNA tests to trace African ancestry and trace that to, um, to Cameroon on my mother's side, West Africa, and to Sierra Leone on my father's side. Wow. And um, through Virginia, they came um, to Kentucky. So I think a little known part of the story is that, you know, we hear about Daniel Boone in Western Kentucky and all that, but, but what happened for lots of families is, and what happened for my family, is that the, um, the slaveholders brought their slaves with them, right. in this case from Virginia, and settled. And those um, enslaved people, in, in large part, built or hel you know, helped to build in a significant measure you know, um, what developed here. Mm -hmm. So my family was amongst those, the Lewises. It's the um, same family of the Meriwether Lewis and the Lewis and Clark expedition. and. All that, so I, I like to say I, I kind of have these big deal family names in my family, you know, these <laughs> big deal white families. But I'm looking at them through the lens of their slaveholding. Mm -hmm. And of course, your family is connected to a extremely brutal incident uh, on the frontier that is the topic of this book that you wrote, Jefferson's Nephews, uh, the murder over in Livingston County. Tell us about that. Right. Um, the book is, um, as you said, Jefferson's Nephews by Boynton Merrill, who came into that land um, in some way. He purchased it, I think. Um, and so he was interested in this history, and he spent um, somewhere between five and ten years in the Livingston County Courthouse and doing a lot of other research that I was really just in awe of. And um, so in, in the book, Jefferson's Nephews, I think we have a picture of the cover mm -hmm. of that book. Mm -hmm. um, in that book, um, he details the murder of this enslaved young boy named George, um, who was held by Charles Lewis and Thomas Jefferson's sister. Mm -hmm. Her name is Lucy. Right. So Charles and Lucy had several children, and among them were Lilburn and Isham. And those are the two brothers that committed this murder. And so as the story goes, George was asked to go to the river. He breaks a vase by accident that um, belonged to the mother. And Lilburn, who had um, a tendency to drink, um, and his brother caught all the slaves in to watch. It was just a horrible, horrible um, murder where they pinned him down, took an ax, um, slit his neck, um, proceeded to dismember him. Mm -hmm. He was 14 years old. And, you know, a lot of times when we think of this story, if we've heard about it, we think of, you know, our focus tends to be on 
the brothers because they did this brutal act. But I try to put myself in the shoes of, you know, this 14 year old boy and what his family members, you know, must have felt. And were any of, because it's difficult to understand slave relationships um, in the unit because people are bought and sold all the time, it's difficult to know for certain if the people in that room that were called in to watch and in some instances participate in the form of helping to dismember because they were instructed to and told, you know, threatened if they didn't. Anyway, long story short, jo George's skull is found by a dog. And this is all documented mm -hmm. in the Lewis oh, yeah. and Corporate Records in, in this phenomenal book that Boynton mm -hmm. Merrill wrote. Um, and so, um, so the brothers decide they're going to be convicted. The brothers decide to make a suicide pact. And so they're going to, they go to the grave site of Lil Burns' previous wife and they decide to shoot each other. Well, the younger brother says, well, what if it doesn't go off quite right? And, and the older brother, Lil Burn, proceeds to show him, well, then lean over the barrel and take a stick and push the, um, and in doing that, in making that demonstration, he actually shoots and kills himself. Lilburn, I mean, the other brother, Isham, is eventually caught, escapes from jail, never to be found again. Mm -hmm. So my ancestors were on, the properties were fairly close, um, Lilburn's property and Randolph's property. Um, in Boynton Merrill's book, he has an inter, he, he has a reprint of an interview with Matilda, and this is my third great-grandmother. Um, Matilda. Mm -hmm. And in this, she says she remembers the murder and, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. Her original interview is in the Cumberland Wave, and no one can find a version of that article, but he reprints the Crittenden Press article from 1880. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could read that if you'd like. Well, in it, she just talks about that she is the, um, the uh, great niece of Thomas Jefferson that her father is Charles, who um, is Lucy Jefferson and Charles Lewis's son. He dies in 1806 in a battle, so he never comes to Kentucky. But Matilda was um, conceived in Virginia. And she talks about that, that in the, um, they say that she was fluent in conversation with an active mind and a memory unshattered by time. She relates many historical events in a well-delineated manner that indicates a parentage above mediocrity. I said you can see that the, the interviewer is biased, you know, in that. Mm -hmm. um, as if, you know, intelligence couldn't come if you weren't related to the Jeffersons. You right. know? <laughs> um, she remembers well the soldiers of General Jackson and she can relate incidents connected to the War of 1812. Um, she talks about, you know, the murder, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So she ends up dying destitute in Crittenden. I've traced the records um, sometime after 1886. But the way that I found this connection, so my grandmother told me that um, Fredonia Thorell Keld was um, my uh, great grandmother. So when I came to Kentucky, I came looking for these Thorell Kelds. And, um, and I kept asking around, Thorell Kelds, Thorell, and they said, no, we don't have any Thorell Kelds. And then I showed somebody the piece of paper and they said, oh, you mean the Threckles? Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, right. I was going to say, now, wait a minute, that's when I was threckled here. Right. <laughs> exactly, right, okay. Exactly. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> accents make a big difference. They do, you know? they do. So, um, so somebody suggested, I went to the library, I didn't know anybody here, and I went to the library, in, and I uh, in, in Marion? Crittenden, in actually, Marion. in Marion, right. uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. I went to the library, and ended up talking um, to... Um, a guy named Greg, he's escaping my last name, his last name right now. Um, anyway, he said, you might talk to Don Hodge. He's a genealogist, he's white, and he knows a lot about the area. I think he's 84, you know, maybe 80 at the time. Mm -hmm. So I leave a message for Don Hodge, and, um, and I get this message on my phone that said, Pam, it's Don Hodge returning your call. Listen, I believe you have Jefferson's blood running through you. Thomas Jefferson. I didn't know that connection until, you know, I was just looking for the Threckolds. 
but the the reason I didn't know is because before she was a Threckle, she was a Lewis. The only reason she was a Threckle is she was sold to Aaron Threckle in 1815. So with that new information, I could then trace the Lewises, mm -hmm. you know, all the way back to Virginia. Mm -hmm. Of course, Jefferson, obviously famous for, for uh, Sally Hemming. Yes. Are you related to her as well? No, I don't believe I am. But I think Jefferson is a very interesting lens to, to look at all this. Um, he owned 600 slaves during the course of his life, mm -hmm. um, freeing only seven, five of those at his birth and all of them the Hemings. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he had a paternalistic view toward, mm -hmm. um, I mean, very much felt that people should be in his service for his comfort. Um, very conflicted, as we all know, some would say hypocritical on the issue of um, slavery. Well, you know, I, in my American history classes, I, I refer to Jefferson as the anti-slavery slave owner because he spoke against slavery so passionate. Uh, he, and, and, yet, and I said, and he, he, you read his writings, he considers African Americans to be inferior to whites, yes. considered women to be inferior to men. Yes. But yet he has this loving relationship with Sally Hemming, which is, is as intimate as you can get. And it's just this, it's this strange mixture here of he, well, he was a racist, but yet he, 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 and apparently from what you read, it was a loving relationship. It wasn't, he just wasn't having a fling with a slave. He was, they were, they, they were in love with each other. And that's fascinating. That, that does appear to be the case. And that Gordon Reed, um, writes a fascinating yeah you know. it, it's it's a real really interesting study in, in human relations mm -hmm. yeah but but um that love you know that he felt still kept the hemmings in a certain position certainly right in society sure, sure. and at any point even there was a period when when Virginia slaveholders were beginning to free their, um, through manumission, were beginning to free their slaves, but Jefferson never. Um, no, no, George Washington did, but, but Jefferson at didn't. At his death. Right. Yes, yes, exactly, mm -hmm. his death. And, and, right. uh, uh, and so Jefferson is always held up as this paragon of democracy right. and all this, right. but yet he could never bring himself to yeah. free his slaves. And Washington, who is looked at as much more conservative than Jefferson? Mm -hmm. He does. Mm -hmm. He does mm -hmm. at his death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, when I went back to Monticello, just when I learned of these connections, I was interested to see, and I was kind of ready for the because I had read some things about the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and them not really, you know, always accurately portraying, you know, Thomas, you know, trying to protect that reputation. Right. Right. And, but I was really surprised that when I took the tour, one of the first things that the uh, tour guide said is that um, when we walked in the door, she talked about Jefferson, Slave Sion, and she said, now we need to deal with that, don't we? I was really mm -hmm. impressed. So, mm -hmm. you know, things evolve, and as, as we all begin, that's why I'm a fan of family history, because it makes history personal. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer this abstract concept. So mm -hmm. sometimes when I do talks, people think because I'm talking about slavery, I'm just talking to African Americans. But I think it's very important for whites, you know, to look at, to see if there's any slave holding in their families mm -hmm. and how that might have, mm -hmm. you know, funneled down mm -hmm. in terms of attitudes and, or maybe attitudes changed over time. Mm -hmm. So to get back, you were related to Thomas Jefferson through his sister, sister Lucy. Lucy. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Okay. So now, you, now you're on the quest. Mr. Mm -hmm. Ha just got the ball rolling. Yeah. Now, then what do you do? Then, um, you know, I started um, um, tracing the Lewises and um, looked at their slave holding going way back um, to 1779 when um, they were very wealthy. And at one point I have a... Um, uh, probate record of 57 slaves that were listed when, um, when Charles Lewis, the older Charles Lewis, died. So um, I wanted to see, you know, what were their motivations, obviously economical <laughs> economics, um, but how, what might have been the treatment of the slaves and really trying to look at and reconfigure the family units to see who, who, um, who were blood related, who might have been separated. One thing I wanted to um, mention was when the 
um, slaveholder dies or when the master dies, that's a very important moment in family history because that's the first time that we ever get the slaves listed by name. Before that, in all the records, they're listed, um, there's something called the slave schedules. Mm -hmm. It's an addendum to the U.S. Census. Exactly. And, but on those, you list the slaveholder and then the slaveholder's property in the form of human beings. Mm -hmm. So it'll say like for let's say George, it would list a 14 MB, a 14 year old male black. And if there were a 14 year old female, 14 FB. Mm -hmm. So we never get the names, you know, because people were considered property. Right. And so it's not until um, after 1865, so in the 1870s census, then that's the first time we get um, the names. but. Before 1865, during slavery, it's when the slaveholder dies that's a very important moment. And I wanted to talk about an example of, I, uh, we have an inventory record. At the top of it, it's, um, it has writing on it, and at the top of it, it has one rat trap. So on this listing, um, it says, one rat trap, 25 cents. And then the next entry, one Negro man, Lee, $1,000. I just think that's such a poignant record. It is. It because is. it shows this, it illustrates Absolutely. this idea of property so vividly. Right, right. chattel. Yes. That's exactly. Wow, that's a powerful document. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Very much so. Now you also have some slides. There was one beautiful slide of a, of a cemetery mm -hmm. in Birdsville. Birdsville. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we could uh, take a look at that, okay. and you can explain what that. Uh, that is, um, Property. It's either the exact property that Randolph Lewis's um, uh, plantation was, or right adjacent to. It. Not exactly yeah. sure, yeah. but um, so this is where Matilda was held in slavery. So it was quite a moment for me, generations later, to be able to come back. And I like to think that the ancestors are saying, "Hey, somebody came back looking for us." <laughs> yeah. But um, to come back and to walk the land, that's a really important thing for me to do as I go back and walk the land and mm -hmm. really try to get in touch with, um, with where they were. So yeah, it's, it's just like, you know, I lived in Africa for two years and I've gone back quite a bit. And the slave ports, um, like in Ghana, Elmina and Cape Coast, just beautiful, like you can't imagine. And I wrote somewhere, it's hard to think of such heinous acts mm -hmm. happening in such beautiful places. Mm -hmm. And this is another example of it. Mm -hmm. We also have a slide of the, uh, the monument over near Smithland. Yes. Uh, the, the, there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that's the, uh, as, you, as you leave Smithland, uh, you go out the highway and it's sort of a grass plot there. Right. And uh, there's also an historical marker uh, nearby that, uh, right. there it is, that talks about that. Rocky Hill, uh, one mile north, home of Lucy Jefferson, Lewis' younger sister to Thomas Jefferson. It's interesting, it, like there's not a marker that says location of the infamous murder of the right. enslaved boy, you know, right. George. So history is written by, you know, people in power and people who, mm -hmm. you know, and so mm -hmm. this is what we get. We don't, Absolutely. you know, get the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your research also took you to the Livingston County Courthouse, yeah. which is an historical building in its own right, yeah. and you've become a fan of preserving yes. that courthouse. Uh, what's going on with that? It's going really well. Um, I found um, several documents related to the hire, hiring and sale of Matilda, of my third great aunt, uh, great grandmother Matilda, who was owned by Randolph Lewis who lived on that land that we just saw. Mm -hmm. And so these are in, like a lot of records are in binders, and many of them, in fact most of them, have been sent to the state archives and microfilmed mm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But not this set called the loose court bundles. So these are pieces of paper where at the time they wrote up the court case and then they tied it with a, rib with a string. That's right. And, um, and so these are in, um, Thankfully, they're in acid-free um, mm. um, uh, folders, mm -hmm. not folders, but uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they're, they're all the original records from 1798. And when you hold the paper, I mean, it's, you, you're very careful that it won't deteriorate further. Mm -hmm. So amazingly, a lot of them are still legible. 
And so in the course of doing my research, obviously I became really interested, not just for my family, it contained so much information, and not just for African Americans whose families were enslaved there, but these are court records for the whole county. So it's very instructive to look at the records for lots of different, oh, wow. you know, yeah. reasons. Yeah. And um, Carol Walker, who was then the county clerk, um, said, well, when I retire, maybe, you know, I'll have some time to help you know, with that. So a year later, I called him and said, will you help? <laughs> you know, will you help? Um, he sent out of office and Sonia Walker, uh, so, I'm sorry, Sonia Williams is the current um, county clerk and very supportive mm -hmm. um, of this project. So she, during the recent flooding, I think we had a picture of what did, Smithland yeah, um, yeah. looked like during the flooding. Um, it was thanks to Sonia and her staff and a lot of good people in Smithland right. that they were able to make sure that all those old records were taken and put and, uh, up uh, high. As this photo shows, uh, the courthouse was, was certainly in danger. It was. Uh, as was the Gower House, the old building, yes. the, the old uh, hotel there in Smithland right. as well. Uh, and, uh, so it shows them. how important, you know, it is to preserve these records. I mean, there's an urgency, I think. Well, and, and I think what's, what's amazing, too, is, of course, that being one of the oldest courthouses yes. in western Kentucky, that they actually have those documents. Yes. Uh, we were talking you were earlier. Saying, well, yeah. uh, it was years ago I went in that courthouse on some other business and ran across these bound volumes of the acts of the Kentucky legislature going to the early early 19th century. And I thought these are incredible. I mean, Murray State has a set of them, a university would. I don't know what became of those, but I, I hope they're they're all right mm -hmm. uh, with that uh, with, with them. Uh, well, now the courthouse itself isn't there some program to restore the courthouse or yes, something going on? Yes, to to well, they're building a new courthouse, right? And it's almost completed. I think it might be completed now. I'm going to go over may, there. It, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so they wanted historical. Um, the marker status, what's landmark status mm -hmm. for the old oh, house, and I believe yeah. that that's been granted. I'm sure it will. Well, somebody told me, I think, that they were going to, that that courthouse has a, has a wing on it that's not original, that they were going to maybe tear that off and have the original courthouse. Did you hear that? Yeah, I think it's the original that they were really wanting the Absolutely. landmark. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the particular yeah, yeah. so well. Well now, are they going to make that a, a museum or what are they going to yes, do? Yes. They're, oh, yeah, wonderful. it's, it's going to, it's just from my limited understanding, but the Historical Society, um, which has been instrumental in mm -hmm. that project, the Livingston County Historical and Genealogical Society, um, and has al also been supportive of this preservation project, which also has a, uh, the concept is also for digitization, because it's not, there are a lot of people who are never going to come back to, exactly. you know, so to make oh, the yeah. records available yeah. online would be and really that, important. That is that is one of the wonderful things about technology is is so many things are digitized now and, yeah. and I think a hundred years from now it'll all be digitized so you won't have to go to Washington the National yes. Archives or whatever to do that. Right. Uh, uh, well that right. is an, a, a, an amazing uh, so what is your next step now? You're, you're continuing on well, your we're voyage? The, we, we had a meeting, we had our first meeting in May, and the Kentucky um, Department of Libraries and Archives came, Trace Kirkwood and Jerry Smith um, came to the meeting, and the former clerk and the current clerk and the historical society oh, that was folks, Smithland. The, meeting was Smithland. the meeting was in Smithland, mm -hmm. and the meeting was to discuss um, how, how much of the loose bundles we would try to preserve in this initial um, round and how we should go about it. And so it was decided that, you know, all of the loose bundle court records should be preserved in, in this. And the um, Kentucky Department of Libraries and Archives has been great because they provided an initial grant for the supplies to um, unfold them and all of that. So now the next step is to actually do the work. And I think that's a, that's a very good point you make about preservation. People don't realize that these documents have to be kept in acid-free yes. containers or the paper just deteriorates. Right. And, and you wonder how many people have lost family records, those old court records, uh, because of that, that there's a real, and you don't want to expose them to light. Right. Light's destructive. Exactly. And, uh, but just, it had to be, though, a real thrill to untie the bundles and just look at what these things were. It's amazing. Uh, and it looks like in some of the boxes that some of the strings have never been untied. Well, they probably have. I mean, what a, 
what an incredible yeah. archaeological find. It is. You it know? is. And, and you know, and you can just see uh, some court official in the 1820s taking a, a, a tying this thing in a bundle and sticking it up, yeah. and thinking, well, somebody will eventually uh, see it. And it, it, it is. It is a real. It, it's a lot of fun to me, being an historian myself, yeah. to handle documents. Years ago, I was doing research at the Tennessee State Library and Archives in Nashville uh, on a, my thesis, which was on the Civil War in Western Kentucky. Oh, okay. And I was going through and, and this archivist says, well, would you like to just handle some of Andrew Jackson's letters? I said, yes, I would. And you think, wow, this is, this is old hickory handled yes. this, and now I am. I it's such a neat it's, it's such, a, it's a, such neat, a neat thing. You're so. absolutely right. I didn't know your uh, background is the A. So I'm here for Betty Dobson's right. A. Right. Yes, and, the, and, and Betty, is a, Betty is a classic example of what an individual can do, but yes. just going at it. She preserved the, the Hotel Metropolitan. She's been on the program many times, yes. and she is now getting the marker to the 8th Artillery yes. in the Battle of, 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 of Fort Anderson here in right. Paducah. And, and again, she is a classic example of what one person can do yes. if you just Get She's with great. It. And, uh, so and, and, and well, now, did you have, did you also tell me you had ancestors yes. in the 8th Artillery? Um, my ancestor, John Todd, who is Miss Matilda's granddaughter, married a guy um, named John Todd, so it's in that line. And um, one, I don't know if we have the slide, but um, there's a slide of, of his Civil War record. So he was from Crittenden and um, joined the Heavy Eighth in May of 1864. Came down to Paducah, mm -hmm. right, right. Yes. And that's a, of course, Paducah was a recruiting point yes. here uh, for African Americans as well as white troops. Then there were Columbus, Kentucky. Columbus, Kentucky was the second largest recruiting station for African Americans oh. in Kentucky. Okay. The, the other was was up in up in uh, just up in Jessamine County near uh, near Nicholasville, okay. up that, uh, Camp Nelson. Uh, and uh, so where you, we have only a minute left, so wh where is your research going to take you now? Are you, you have other avenues you want to explore? Well, yeah, I think there's still a lot to learn about Matilda and her family here in Livingston and Crittenden. So um, I just plan on ha hanging out for a while, <laughs> you know, just continuing to come back, you know, finding as much time as I can to research in the courthouse and to talk to people. Because when you're tracing African-American enslaved ancestors, white families can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And so if there are people that, um, you know, have an interest in slaveholding in Livingston and Crittenden counties or just in a preservation of the records, um, we'd love to hear from them. Mm -hmm. Well, in the few seconds we have left, what would be some contact information, telephone number, email, whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, my email is like my name, Pam Smith. It's psmith30 at aol.com. And my phone is 312-719-3740. That's the Chicago area code. I know yes. that one. So. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank and you, when you're next down in this neck of the woods again, uh, give us a holler and we'll, we'll talk some more. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure. My guest today was Pam Smith. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time.